praising Allah Azza wa Jalla upon that basis. That's different for the life of this world. Somebody comes, right? And he does you a good turn, he does you a favor, right? So after he's gone, you praise that person. That praise is not like the praise directed at Allah Azza wa Jalla because it is not going to be based upon that same level of mahabba and ta'zeem regardless of what he did for you. It's not the mahabba and ta'zeem, the love and declaring the greatness and the majesty of Allah Azza wa Jalla that your alhamdu is based upon for Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's not the same. Similarly, if you hear of a person who's particularly skilled in a particular action, like he's very good at fixing cars, no matter what his level of skill arrives at, how excellent he is in that particular action, you will never praise him like you praise Allah Azza wa Jalla with Alhamdu because it is not upon the basis of Al Mahabba and the Ta'deen. Right? Allah mentioned in Surah Al Baqarah that from amongst mankind there are people who take idols and are their partners besides Allah. Then they love them as they should love only Allah. But those people who believe are greater in their love for Allah Azza wa Jalla, right? So my point is, is that when you say Alhamdulillah, you are praising Allah based upon Al Mahabba and the Ta'deem. Where do those two emotions become manifest? Al Mahabba and Ta'deem. What? Which part of the body do they affect? Your heart. It's in your heart. Right? So that's why saying Alhamdulillah is an act of worship and it's Tawheed Al Ibadah or Uluhiyah. That first two terms, Alhamdulillah, is an affirmation of Tawheed Al Ubudiyah, the worship of Allah. Because there are three types of Tawheed, right? The first two ayat include both types. And Alhamdulillah, those first two terms is an affirmation of Tawheed al-Ibadah. Why? Because with your heart, right, you have that emotion of al-Mahabba na ta'zeem for the fact that Allah Azza wa Jalla is deserving of being praised with this term Alhamdu, and then you articulate it upon your tongue. You say it upon your tongue, and that is an act of worship. Just when you say, La ilaha illallah, when you say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul, when you utter, you say the kalima, uh, the testimony of faith, that is an act of worship, then similarly, Alhamdulillah, upon the tongue, which is based upon al mahabban ta'zeem in the heart, is an act of worship affirming the tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Then we have, Rabbil Alameen. Rabbil Alameen is, an affirmation of the other type of a Tawheed, which is Tawheedu ar Why? Because you are saying that Allah, Rabbu al alamin is the Lord of al alamin That's how Rabb is translated, the Lord of al alamin But what does it actually mean? Allah Azza wa Jalla in Surah Al-A'raf said, Inna Rabbakum Allahu alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ardi fi sitat ayram thumma istawa ala al-arsh. That your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days, thumma istawa ala al-arsh, then he ascended above the throne. Yugshi layla al-nahar yatlubu hathitha. And he causes the night to follow the day quickly. Washamsa. Uh, and the sun, and the moon, and the stars, they're subservient to his command. They are obedient to his command. 
Right? Then Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Allah lahu al khalq wal amru tabarak Allahu rabbul alameen. It's not al khalq, the creation, and al amru, the command for Allah alone, rabbul alameen, the rabb of al alameen, of the universe, of the entire creation. So in this ayah in Surah Al Araf, Allah Azza wa Jalla affirmed that from his rububiyya, his lordship, which is where this term uh, is based upon Rabb from his Rububiyya is that Allah Azza wa Jalla is Al Khalik, the Creator, besides whom there is no other Creator because everybody else in creation who creates things does not create out of nothing. They just transform one thing into another, like a carpenter who transforms a piece of wood into a table. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He creates from nothing. That is why He is Al Khalik. And that's why only he can be Al-Khaliq. He, he also alone has Al-Amru, the command, meaning he alone organizes the affairs of the creation. And that is a very important point. That the Muslims in this time have the greatest need for to understand that Allah alone is the one al mudabbir the one who organizes the affairs of creation in surah ala imran allah azza wa jalla said qul allahumma malikal mulk tu'ti al mulk man tasha say that allah is malikal mulk the owner of al mulk the dominion of the heavens and the earth that you alone, Allah, you give the kingdom to whomsoever He wants. And you remove it from whomsoever you want. You honor whoever you want. And you disgrace whoever you want. In your hand is all good. Indeed, you have an ability over all matters. Right? Allah Azza wa Jalla in that ayah in Surah Ala Imran affirmed that He alone, Malik al Mulk, is the owner of the kingdom, the dominion of the universe, the heavens and the earth, all of creation. Allah alone is. And by extension to that principle that Allah alone is, He then said, you give your kingdom to whomsoever you want. Uh, and you remove it from whomsoever you want. You honor whomsoever you want and you disgrace whomsoever you want. In your hand is all good. Indeed, you have the ability over all matters. Why is this one ayah now so important? It's not hidden from any Muslim. Indeed, even non-Muslims. Even non-Muslims. Recently when I, I was working in Blackburn, one of them, the non-Muslim, he made a comment about the condition of the world and how in the West things were improving that the economic uh, state was improving, that living standards were rising, that other aspects of the infrastructure were continuously being improved. Then he looked at me and he said, well, it's improving everywhere except in the Middle East, right? In the Muslim world. Even he recognized that the tribulations and the calamities that have afflic afflicted so many parts of this world seem to surround and concern the Muslim areas. So it's not hidden from a non-Muslim in addition to a Muslim. Now, when we look at the solution to this problem, the economists and the sociologists and the philosophers and the psychologists and the artists and the artisans and all of these individuals will all give you a different reason trying to explain how to remove the humiliation which has now surrounded the believers. They will all advance a different reason. And they will speak 
about the Americans and the West and the Israelis and the economic system and the Dagelic system and the Freemasons and all of these as though they're the ones who control the affairs of creation. As though they are the ones who if they decide something in the White House that it's going to take place all over the Muslim world. They forgot seemingly that Allah Azza wa Jalla is Rabbil Alameen. That that's the first ayah that we read in every raqqa, in every prayer that we pray during the day and the night. That Allah Rabbil Alameen. And as I mentioned, that Allah being a Rabb means that He alone is Al Khalik, the Creator. That He alone is Al Mudabbir, the one who organizes the affairs. That He alone is Al Malik, the owner of the creation. He alone, as the ayah states in Surah Al Imran, He gives His kingdom to whomsoever He wants and He removes it from whomsoever He wants. He honors whomsoever He wants and He disgraces whomsoever He wants. But that honoring and that disgracing, it's not done for any reason, it's not done in a haphazard manner or without any purpose. That is done based upon his perfect knowledge and wisdom. And as we mentioned before regarding the Israelites, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Ya Halal Kitabi, O you people of the book, Lastum ala shayin hatta tukimu tawrata wal injila wa ma unzila laykum in rabbikum. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, O people of the book, you are upon nothing. You are upon nothing hatta until you tukimu tawrata, you establish the tawrat, meaning you live in accordance with the rules of a tawrat. Wal Injila and Al Injil, the book given to Isa alayhi salam. Wa ma unzil alaykum al rabbikum, and that which has been revealed to you from your Lord, meaning Al Quran. If Allah Azza wa Jalla addressed the Israelites, and He addressed them out of concern for them, wanting He die for them, guidance for them. If Allah Azza wa Jalla addressed the Israelites and said to them that you are upon nothing until you implement the Torah and the Injil and Al Quran, then what therefore of the believers? What therefore of the Muslims? Are the Muslims governed by any other principle except one that the people who came before are governed by? Are they subject to any rule except the same rules that the people who came before? There's a principle in Al Quran. That <coughs> whatever musibah, calamity you are afflicted with, so whatever has happened to us. In this time, with regards to the Muslims and their condition, Fabima Kasabat Aidikum, then it is because of what your hands have earned, Wayafuan Kathir, and Allah, He forgives much. And in Surah Rum, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Zahara al Fasadu fil Burri wal Bahri bima Kasabat. Allah Azzawajalla said that evil has appeared on the land and on the sea bima kasabat aidin nas because of what the hands of people have earned. Why? Liudhikahum ba'dalladhi amilu so they can taste some of that which they have earned لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So perhaps they can return back to the deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So from Allah being رَبِّ Alameen, When we say رَبِّ Alameen, Then it means that our Lord Allah is the sole owner, the sole creator 
and the sole disposer of the affairs of the heavens and the earth. So if Allah Azza alone is the one responsible for that, does it make sense that you go to every individual other than Allah Azza and ask for a change of your condition? No. The obligation upon a Muslim is to rectify himself. So the one, the one who has abandoned the prayer, he returns to the prayer. And the one who doesn't fast do Ramadan, the obligatory fast, he must do that. And the one who doesn't pay zakat, he must start doing that. And they must start following the sunnah. Then you call upon Allah Azza wa Jalla to change your condition and to restore his favor upon the ummah, upon the believers, as he did with those who came before. So that, in brief, is the meaning of Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And to complete, we'll just mention the next ayah, which is, Ya Muhammad, <coughs> after Alhamdulillah. <laughs> right, I told you the first few lessons will be easy. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And we have already spoken in great detail about Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. But the first point to note is this. That in the first two ayat in Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah Azza wa Jalla has affirmed the three types of Tawheed. Tawheed meaning when you affirm the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jalla. What that means is that you affirm that Allah alone is deserving of your worship and you affirm that He alone is the one who is divine and you affirm that Allah alone is the one who has these unique and perfect names and attributes. As soon as you give anything in creation some aspect of these three aspects of Tawheed, meaning as soon as you worship other than Allah, as soon as you believe that something has some special divinity, some divine power, as soon as you take one of Allah's beautiful names and attributes and you give them to a creation, then you've negated Tawheed and Allah no longer is unique. That, in summary, is a Tawheed. Now, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is an affirmation of the third part of a Tawheed. So, let's have a recap. Alhamdulillah is which uh, part of Tawheed, an affirmation of which part? <laughs> Tawheed al ubudiyya Right? Why? You're praising Allah. Right? You're praising Allah with your heart, with mahabba, love and ta'zeem, and glorifying Him, and upon your tongue, by saying Alhamdulillah, that's an act of worship for which you'll be rewarded. Rabbil Alameen is the second part of Tawheed, which is? Tawheeda Rububiyya, the Lordship of Allah, that He alone is Al Khalik, the Creator, that He alone is Al Mudabbir, the Organizer, and that He alone is Al Malik, the owner of the affairs of the heavens and the earth. The third part of a Tawheed is Al Asma wa Sifat, the beautiful names and attributes of Allah that belong only to Him. Right? That belong only to Him. So, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, two names of Allah. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. We mentioned three differences. Who remembers the three differences that we mentioned between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? Yes, Muhammad. I think so. Go on, try. Bismillah. The first is... Ar-Rahman is uh, mercy for everyone, so in the dunya, so the Muslims <coughs> and the Kufar. Right. And you have uh, Rahim, which is just for the believers on Yom al -Qiyama. Right. That's you like that, Muhammad. Yeah. Uh, the second one is um, that Ar-Rahman is for so you can't call somebody by Ar Rahman. You have to say Abdul Rahman. Yeah. But with regards to Rahim, you can. 
So you can say Rahim or Abdul Rahim. Right. MashaAllah. And? Right, the reason why you're now stuck on the third point <coughs> is because the first one and the second you've combined. Right. <laughs> Ar Rahman is the one in possession of a vast amount of mercy. So both Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim, the attribute is Ar Rahman, mercy. But Ar Rahman, that name, is the name of the one who is described with that vast quantity of mercy. So vast is the mercy of Allah that when he described how he had ascended above his throne, what did he say? Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. He never said that Allah is istawa upon the throne. He said Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. That this Ar-Rahman, the one in, in possession of this vast quantity of mercy, he is the one who ascended above the throne. Meaning his mercy is huge. Ar-Rahim is the one whose mercy is wasila. Wasila means it comes, it reaches, it arrives to the creation. Right? So they say that Ar Rahman is a wasifa. It's a description. Ar Rahim is al wasila, meaning the mercy comes to the creation. Right? It's connected to the one who's affected by that mercy. That's the first. The second that leads from it. Is yes, in relation to the life of this world, everybody enjoys the rahmah of Allah. Do we not have here rain that falls from the sky, fruit and vegetation that come forth from the, the earth? We live in security. We go back to our families. We see the faces of our children in the, the evening when you put them to bed and when you see them in the morning. You go and visit your parents. Do you not see them? You can walk out on the street, there's no fear. That is all from the Rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jalla. وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا As Allah Azza wa Jalla said that if you to enumerate, enumerate the uh, blessings of Allah, then you would not be able to do that. That is for everybody. And remember the greatest type of Rahmah we said is Allah sending a messenger. We never sent you, O Muhammad وسلم, except to say Rahmah, a mercy for Al Alameen. And Allah sending down a book was another great Rahmah. Because if you have nothing in this world, you have nothing in terms of possession. Then you take Al Quran and you understand it and you memorize it and you act in accordance to it. You're the richest person on the face of this earth because you have one thing that so many other people don't, and that is what we call atumanina tranquility. That those people who believe and then their hearts are caused to become tranquil with the remembrance of Allah is not. Tranquility acquired by the remembrance of Allah. So, in the life of this world, everybody has access to the Messenger وسلم, and his book. But in the hereafter, the Rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jalla will be for the believers alone. No longer for those who disbelieve in Him. Their access to the Rahmah of Allah will stop once death comes to them. And after that, it's the establishment of the hour. That in brief, and we mentioned the evidences in the other lessons. So, from the most beautiful and perfect names and attributes of Allah is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, two names, and uh, Rahmah is, mercy is the attribute from them. If you take one or more of any of the names and attributes of Allah and you give them to something or someone in creation, 
then you've committed shirk with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Why? Because we worship Allah because he, he alone is in possession of those names and attributes. So, I don't know whether uh, this still happens, but do you remember those strange letters that, that we used to receive of our C-mail from Ajmer Sharif in India? Right? And you look at it and you think, SubhanAllah, this has come all the way from India in this tatty old envelope and it's still got here. And then you have a look at it and it's really poorly worded. I mean, it's full of grammatical mistakes. It's on that strange grey coloured paper with dodgy print. And you read it and one of the unique miracles of this individual is that, quote, he could fill barren wounds. He could fill barren wombs, meaning give you children. And you think, subhanAllah, that this person, he claims that he's a Muslim and is calling people to sacrifice and to donate towards an individual, hoping that he is going to respond by giving you a child. What was the ayah that we recited regarding Ibrahim alayhi salam? قال الحمد لله الذي وحبني على الكبر إسماعيل وإسحاق إن ربي لسميع الدعاء. He said, الحمد لله who gave me, despite me being old, Ismail and Ishaq. My two sons, alayhim as salam. Inna Rabbi la samir al dua. Indeed, my Lord is the one who responds to the supplication. That is from, as we mentioned, the beautiful name of Allah al Wahhab. Because as we explained in our previous lesson, that every time Allah Azza wa Jalla mentioned in Al Quran that He gives a son or a daughter, he gives a child to someone in creation, he uses that verb Wahhaba. That verb Wahhaba, from it we have the name Al-Wahhab. Right? Wahhaba means to bestow, to give. The name from that verb, that action is Al-Wahhab. So if you now believe that there's somebody else in creation who has the ability to give you a son or a daughter, then you've taken one of the unique names and attributes of Allah and you've given it to somebody in creation. As soon as you do that, is Allah unique with regards to that action? No. Allah's no longer unique because He can do it too. I know sometimes it seems a bit complicated, but it's not. If Allah alone is Al Wahhab, and Allah alone, as He said in Surah Shura, Lillahi mulku samawati wal ard yakhluku ma yasha, that Allah alone, He alone has mulku samawati wal ard, the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, yakhluku ma yasha, He creates whatever He wants. Then he said, Yahabu li mayyashau inathan. He gives to whomsoever he wants a daughter. Wa yahabu li mayyashau the kura. And he gives to whomsoever he wants a son. He does that. That's why Zakariya alayhi salam qala rabbi la tadarni faradan wa anta khayrul warithin. The, the beautiful du'a of Zakariya alayhi salam when he became old and his hair had become white and his bones had become brittle he called upon Allah and he said my Lord la tadarni faradun don't leave me without a child and you're the best of those who give inheritors and you're the best of those who give inheritors وَوَحَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَىٰ So Allah Azza wa Jalla said فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we responded to him. And what do we do? وَوَحَبْنَا That same verb is used وَحَبْنَا We gave to him. Who? Who did Allah Azza wa Jalla give us? A son to Zakariya alayhi salam. Yahya. 
Zakaria alayhi salam, he didn't call upon anyone other than Allah. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he didn't call upon anyone other than Allah. They called upon Allah. Why? Because Allah alone is Al-Wahhab. Right. But if you now take that name and that attribute and you give them to Ajmer Sharif or whoever it is, what is Allah now unique? No. We worship Allah because He's unique with His names and attributes. But if you're now going to take them off Him and give them to people in creation, then why would you worship Allah? Then you would worship Him, right? That's why it's all false anyway. Because He, he couldn't help Himself. He couldn't help Himself in the grave. He's not going to be able to help you. And He'll only lead them further astray. That call. Which is why Ar Rahman Ar Rahim in two ayat of Surah Al Fatiha, in two ayat in Surah Al Fatiha, Allah Azza wa Jalla affirms the three parts of a Tawheed. And we haven't even got to Iyaka Na'bud wa Iyaka Nastainya. We haven't got to the ayah that explicitly states, You alone do we worship. The first two affirm the three parts of Tawheed. So, how therefore? How therefore can someone worship other than Allah after understanding that? You just need to understand the first two ayat of Surah Al-Fatiha and you would never direct any portion of your worship to other than Allah Azza wa Jalla. But why does it still happen in the Muslim Ummah? Because they don't understand. That's the purpose of these lessons, to teach the people what Allah has revealed in order that they can understand. One of the great scholars, Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani, rahimahullah, he used to say that the Mushrikun of Makkah will conclude on this point. The Mushrikun of Makkah, they didn't reject the da'wah of the Prophet وسلم, because they didn't understand it. They didn't reject it because they didn't understand it. They rejected it because we made all the gods into one? No, no. No, no, they rejected it because they did understand it. Not because they didn't, but because they did. That's why Allah Azza wa Jalla said that they say, when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to them and said, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. They did understand that if we now say this, if we say it, then we have to stop directing any portion of our worship to our idols. Then we have to stop sacrificing to them. We have to stop praying to them. We, start, we have to stop having tawakkul in them, reliance and dependence. We have to stop having hope that they're going to bring us some good and avert any harm. We have to stop fearing them, that if we don't direct our worship to them, then they're going to bring harm to us. We have to stop all of this, and they couldn't do it. So when they rejected La ilaha illallah, it wasn't because they didn't understand it, it's because they did, and they were not willing to do it. That's why they said, He's made all of our gods, meaning all of these different gods that we've taken, idols besides Allah, who do all of these different things for us, and He's grouped them together and He said, That is Allah Azza wa Jalla alone. We today, and the Muslims, they recite the kalima, they recite La ilaha illallah, then they do the opposite to it. Then they'll wear charms and amulets around their neck. Then they'll go to fortune tellers. They'll, <coughs> they'll go to people who say to them, we can give you this, or we can avert the harm from you by doing this and so on and so on. We can do all of this. Why? Because they didn't even understand, Alhamdulillahi, that that's Tawheed al-Ibadah, Rabbil Alameen, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, al-Rahman, al-Rahim, Tawheed in al-Asma wa Sifat. And that's our function. As Allah Azza wa Jalla mentioned in Surah Nahl, 
لِتُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا لَهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ In order to uh, make it clear to them that which Allah has revealed لَا لَهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So perhaps that they can think وَاللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ أَعْلَمُ سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك